Welcome to More Than Dentistry, where your hosts Evert and Waldo discuss life, dentistry and everything in between with dentists around the world. Hello and welcome to the More Than Dentistry podcast. I'd like to introduce Jamil. The guys that don't know Jamil, he's a, a dentist from Scotland. He's originally South African born. You won't say that with the accent, but he's, uh, his parents are South African. <laughs> Um, I met him through the digital smile design stuff. He's a digital um, instructor and a Christian coachman. Uh, he's also a, a, a slow dentistry network um, guy, and I think that's why we need to speak to him. And he's one of the guys that's really cutting edge in dentistry, and um, I've been following his stuff on Instagram, and I've been trying to get to speak to him for a long time, and, and now with this COVID-19, I think it's a good time to catch up with you. Just to give you a bit of background, I'm sure you know what's going on in South Africa. We've been placed under a lockdown from tomorrow evening. And uh, we've got very little information on how we're supposed to work as dentists. We sort of didn't really give us clear instructions and clear information. Um, and the information from government is that we, we allowed to be open. But I think it's confusing a lot of people and uh, a lot of practices are going on like normal and they're not changing anything. I, I heard one of the big group practices, they, the message they got was that they're open for business as normal. So what I want you to just tell us, what are you guys doing in Scotland and what do you think we should be doing in South Africa? How should we change our approach to patients? Should we be open? Should we close and just see emergencies? Um, and if we see patients, what precautions should we be taking when seeing those patients? So if you can just maybe elaborate a little bit and then then we're gonna we're gonna give everyone some time to to ask questions so on the app there's a place where you can put your hand up so if you've got a question towards the end i'm gonna say when we can ask questions for jamil and then we can have, open it up to a discussion and then just talk about what we think and what we're gonna do um, and also if if we can share this message i think a lot of guys are kind of not taking this thing seriously enough um so yeah jamil um Thanks for joining us and, and tell us about your practice and what you guys are doing. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So first of all, hi, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to uh, join you uh, this evening or this afternoon here in Scotland. Um, and thanks to Everett as well. Uh, I've got a lot of time for Everett. It seems that you're not really working most of the time, right? You're always uh, uh, on Jeffrey's Bay, uh, either swimming or kite surfing or something like that. So this lockdown is going to be easy for you. <laughs> Because yeah, you're just going to do the same things that you did before, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, very, it's a very strange and crazy time in the world right now, isn't it? Um, and I think you started off by saying that, um, you know, you guys have gone into lockdown. And, uh, you know, in, in many respects, that's really far ahead of many, many, many places in the world. So I think South Africa should really be congratulated for that. Uh, I mean, we only went into lockdown uh, or a a, a, a proposed lockdown about two, three days ago. And it's definitely not the same as you guys have. I mean, I'm getting all the, the, the messages from, from my South African dental friends and um, uh, uh, family that's in SA and uh, the regulations that you've got to follow and the armies on the streets and the, the, the things that you need to uh, have with you or you will need to have with you to go out to get um, uh it's, you know, proceeds from the supermarket, you know, that's, that, that's really far ahead of lots of countries in the world. But I really do think that it's, um, that it's appropriate for the time that we're living in. And I wish that, that many other countries, including our own, uh, took this as seriously, it seems, as South Africa is doing it. I know, obviously, you guys have a, you know, have a problem in South Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub -Saharan Africa with the amount of immunocompromised people, people you have. So it, is, it has the potential to get really, really serious over there. Uh, and I think it looks as if the right things are being done. So I think South Africa really has to be congratulated for that. Uh, and hopefully, God willing, uh, you know, we can come out of this the other side and go back to our, our lives as soon as possible. Um, I think you also mentioned, uh, Everett, that you didn't really get a lot of guidance from SADA. And that's pretty much similar to us here as well. I mean, the General Dental Council has put out really almost no guidance for us. Um, it's been left up to the chief dental offices of um, the different countries, Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, 
uh, to put up some guidelines. And um, these guidelines have come out in dribs and, dribs and drabs. And in a lot of cases, doesn't really have a lot of scientific basis or, 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 or strength behind it. But it's just what they think is necessary for this time that we're living in. So uh, you're, you're totally right in saying that, uh, you know, one thing that this time is showing us where the world's been shut down, we really showed, been shown who's got our back. And unfortunately, it's really not been um, the government and especially in our country. Uh, it's not been the, 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 the bodies that are, are supposed to be regulating us and giving us the, um, the, the guidelines to follow. Um, and it's really disheartening in these respects. And I mean, even, I don't know about you guys, when, you know, the, the things like the banks who you would, you would think would be a little bit more sympathetic, you know, they've put up um, the overdraft um, rates from like 9% up to about 40% during this time. So it looks like everybody's in it for themselves. Um, and I think what, what we as UK dentists and Scottish dentists uh, are finding out that we've really been left uh, to ourselves to try and come up with something that's going to be workable now and workable, I think, sometime in the future as well. So um, there's a lot of, there's not a lot of guidance out there. But one um, thing that I'm really super happy about is uh, the Slow uh, Dentistry Global Network uh, that you mentioned, Everett. And um, for those of you that don't know, Slow Dentistry is really um, the brainchild of Miguel Stanley, also a South African. Um, you know, he was born in South Africa. He stays out in Portugal. He's probably one of the most famous dentists in the world at the moment. And uh, a guy that I've got a, really a lot of time for um, is really a visionary. He really has patience and the, you know, the, the profession as his number one goal. Um, you know, he's not out to make a fast buck or anything like that. And um, he's really trying to do his best, use his position that he's in for the betterment of the profession and, the, and definitely the betterment of the patient. So um, slow dentistry is something I think uh, you guys going to hear a lot more of, uh, especially because of this. And, you know, there's, we, we had the slow dentistry um, first conference in London in November last year. Um, and it was really well attended, uh, sponsored by Voco, right in the heart of London. I got a lot of good press. Um, but again, it's one of these things that, uh, you know, this, the, the, it's not super sexy, right? Because it's not like clinical dentistry that we're talking about. It's really about patient management. It's really about um, making sure that your practices are clean and sterile. It's about doing dentistry in the right way. It's about trying to follow gold standard protocols. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the things that we all do behind the scenes, but we don't get paid for. And, you know, for that reason, I think a lot of people take it lightly. So, you know, planning cases properly, uh, utilizing things like DSD, digital smile design to make things more accurate, predictable, efficient, um, you know, taking care of our patients, making sure we, we're doing the consent process properly, making sure we're giving the anesthesia and waiting for the correct amount of time. So there's loads of, you know, there's, a, there's four main cornerstones for the slow dentistry um, um, uh, to become a slow dentistry practice. We probably all do them to varying degrees. Uh, but I think it's going to be something that you will hear a lot of very quickly. And what we've been doing over the last week, some of the slow go, uh, dentistry global ambassadors is trying to put through some, some guidelines that dentists can follow um, uh, in this time of, of, of this, this worrying time with this virus all about. Uh, and it's yet to be released. So you guys are going to be kind of the first ones to, to, to hear the, the, the different protocols. It may change slightly, um, uh, but hopefully by the end of this week, beginning of the following week, it will be released. So a lot of these things are coming from uh, people in our network that have lived through uh, H1N1, that have lived through uh, SARS, um, uh, you know, where not SARS from, from your, from your guys' point of view, right? The, the income tax guys, uh, but the SARS, the, the bird flu and the, the, the respiratory uh, issues from the virus. Uh, people like Ronnie Yap based out in Hong Kong. Uh, people like uh, Huang uh, based out in Beijing in China. So, so they've been through it and they've had to adapt their clinics uh, to be able to run in a safe, predictable and efficient manner. So uh, without um, too much more ado, I think what we'll do is we'll just uh, go through each of the points, and it's about 10 points or so, and uh, if you want ever, just, just feel free to, um, to, 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 to button and ask questions, because uh, it's actually good that this is like a bit of a sounding board. 
Yeah. That what do people understand? What things should be should be included in these things uh, going you forward? I should, um, oh. should I unmute everyone so everyone can ask a question if they feel like it? Look, it's up to them. They're more than welcome. I think what you can do is you can unmute if you if you not uh, if you if you're new to Zoom. What you can do is you can mute, you can unmute it, but then the individual uh, can go to their little picture. If you hover over it, you'll get a little um, icon there, and you can mute your own mic. Okay. So that means when you want to speak, you unmute it yourself. So you can mute everyone's um, if you'd like. Uh, Everett, and then when you want to speak, just unmute it, and um, that way we don't get any background noise. Um, so so number one. Uh, and again, these are in no particular order, uh, but number one, um, it goes without saying that we have to regularly clean the practice. You know, the floors and the surfaces of the non-clinical areas and the clinical areas uh, should be scrubbed and cleaned um, on a daily basis and uh, with proper detergent, with proper cleaning fluids. And it's not just the, the, the clinical surfaces that we will clean. It's not just the, um, the floors, but especially now, um, this is something that we were doing two or three weeks before it hit us here in the UK. But all the, mm -hmm. all the places that patients would touch, so the door handles, um, the, the, the handles of the door inside and outside, uh, this is being cleaned not just once or twice per day, but regularly throughout the day. Okay, so, so super important that um, our reception staff in our clinic, uh, you know, every 30 minutes or so, uh, we'll be taking the wipes and wiping the reception desk down. We'll be going out and wiping the seats down. We'll be going out and wiping the handles of the doors down from the outside coming into the surgery and each of the individual um, surgeries themselves. So that goes without saying. We want to have practices. We want to have um, you know, disinfected environments. And uh, it's very important to have somebody in the practice. What I was saying was that we want to have somebody, if preferable, allocated to do this. So it's maybe one member of the reception team, obviously each nurse in the surgery, um, but somebody that's taking responsibility for the, for, the, for the cleaning of the practice, the actual superficial floors, clinical areas, door handles, these type of things, okay? And you were saying so number two, uh, so this is what we were doing uh, in our clinic every so often. So every 30 minutes or so, because we have uh, some patients coming through regularly, they're touching the reception desk, and the problem with this virus is that you don't know who's an asymptomatic spreader. And that's the real thing because it's got such a long incubation period, you know, 14, you know, can appear anyway within 14 days, usually around about seven days. You can have people that don't exhibit any symptoms, but they're spreading the disease. It's on their hands. They're touching the, uh, the reception desk. They're touching the handles. And then this is a big way that um, the virus can spread. So on a regular basis, it doesn't have to be every half an hour or so, just half an hour that we put into our clinics. Okay. But somebody should be trying to clean these areas. Okay. Number two, um, all staff should regularly be cleaning their hands for at least 20 seconds, uh, preferably with soap and water, uh, occasionally with um, uh, the hand sanitizer, but it's better with, with soap and water. We know that. Um, there's a lot of great videos going on, the, on, on, on Instagram and, and uh, Twitter about the best way to, to wash your hands, you know, the surgical ways. As dentists, we should know this anyway, but perhaps. Um, our, our staff members don't, maybe our reception team don't, um, maybe the nurses don't, uh, you know, if they don't uh, assist us when we're placing implants or doing surgical procedures. So there's, there's lots of really nice 20, 30 second videos showing you the best ways of, of, of cleaning your hands. And, um, you know, what we're asking in, in, in this point is that we should be able to do it, but we should also be able to train our staff and reinforce this on a regular basis because it's not enough, you know, just telling a person wants to do it. We have to be able to remind them repetitively again and again. And Miguel actually put a, a, a note to say that we should really have uh, posters on hand washing near every basin. So as a result of this, we can, we can be reminded about it. The staff can be reminded about it. Uh, and this, you know, is, is really primarily for our own safety because uh, we know that taking all the precautions at work, the greatest risk is not coming from us to the patient, but from the patient to us. Right, all the people that we're seeing, we don't know, you know, what's happening there, where they're coming from, what they have, are they are they being truthful about what they're saying, where they visited, the temperature that they had, you know, do they have any symptoms? We don't know this, so we really we really want to make sure that uh, our staff remain ha healthy, and by and and from that, our families remain healthy because we'll be taking our clothes, we'll be taking our 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 uh, shoes into the houses where we where we live. 
And this can be a big problem if we have um, elderly uh, parents that live with us or people who are immunocompromised, asthmatics, these type of things in our houses as well. So it's super important that we, we make sure that we wash hands at least for 20 seconds, preferably with soap and water, and we can have the, um, the hand sanita sanitizers uh, as well. Uh, the next point is about in every clinic, there should be really a clean zone. Um, now, this is something new that we hadn't really discussed with slow dentistry, but I think Miguel has it in his clinic in Lisbon. And I think it's really important that we all try and think about this, that uh, there's a clean zone where only dental and medical personnel can go. Okay, so in, in everybody's clinic, this is going to be different. So if you've got a small clinic, maybe you've got to have as the dirty zone, the reception. But as soon as you step into the clinics, the actual surgeries, that's where you start into the clean zone. Or if the clinic is big enough, then you have a particular area which is designated from here on in is the clean zone. And what would mean by then is that uh, in the clean zone, only people with properly disinfected clothes, disinfected shoes, um, the shoe coverings as well, if the patients are coming in, you know, the plastic wraps that they put over their feet, um, uh, you know, these things is disposable, ones that you can take it on and off should be, should be happening. So um, really important to uh, limit the people that are going into these zones. Uh, and if the, obviously the patients need to come in, but as the patients come in, uh, they need to put on these shoes, make sure they've used the hand sanitizers that will come to in another point that we should really have at the reception desk, at the entrance to the operatory, in the surgery as well, so that we, you know, not only are we washing our hands, but the patients are coming from outside, they're washing that, uh, their, their hands. So typically in our clinic, uh, just over the last three weeks, the patients would enter the door to the clinic, there would be a hand sanitizer there, they would, they would wipe their hands with the hand sanitizer, they would sit down, uh, they would come into the surgery for their, for their dental work, we have hand sanitizer again that they would utilize before they go to the reception desk. At the reception desk, we are not taking any um, uh, paper money anymore, uh, but we were just using contactless uh, methods. So um, until we don't find out exactly where the virus is staying, where it's not, uh, it's better to be safe than sorry. So back to this clean zone, really important that we have clean zones designated. And again, a lot of these things are gonna think is this overkill? Is this something that we're going overboard with? But I really think that this is best practice that we really have to try and get in the habit of using. And we've been really shaken up by this virus because um, if our practices in the world can be shut down by this, you know, it's really important that we have systems and protocols in place that allows us to do these things, um, uh, you know, to practice our jobs in a safe uh, way for ourselves, our staff, our patients, and our families in the house. So coming back to the, the clothes that we wear, I think a lot of us sometimes come in to the office in the, in, sometimes in scrubs, sometimes in uniforms already. Maybe our staff come in like, like that. I think what we're asking uh, our patients to do, or what we're asking our staff to do, especially in our clinic, is to come in with their normal clothes and then to get changed into their clinical wear in the clean zone. So the, 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 um, the scrubs are disinfected, the scrubs are clean. Um, and then you'll get changed into that. You'll change your shoes. So we're not taking the same shoes that you should have one pair of shoes for your, um, for your clinic. Um, and you'd wear them there and you wouldn't wear them outside because we don't want to take what's inside out. And definitely we don't want to bring what's outside in. So to try and keep it as clean as possible, uh, really super important to think about the clothes. Think about the fact that we should be taking the tunics off, the scrub tops off leaving it at the clinic, washing them at the clinic. Now, obviously, this is going to take much more time. This is going to be something that is going to be a little bit more labor intensive, but it's all things that we have to be starting to think about. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's things that we have to start getting in the mind of that how can we make things much more clean, clean much more, more, more sterile, um, so that, again, you know, it's, it's safety first for ourselves, our families, and our, our staff. Um, Another important thing to mention just while we're at the clean zones and the dirty zones is that in, I don't know how much you guys get with, um, with deliveries coming into the clinic, um, you know, whether that's equipment, whether that's Amazon packages, whether it's letters, boxes, etc., consumables being arrived on a daily basis. So um, number one, 
thing that we noticed is before we would have to sign a pad or we'd have to sign documents that the FedEx people would bring in. Now they've stopped that as well, right? So you don't have to sign anything. They just mark it down that you've signed it on their behalf. So we, want, we don't want to be touching the pens. We don't want to be uh, using their pens and signing on the paper and holding the paper for them, okay? Um, and as well, the packages that we're taking in, before they're being brought into the clean zone, they are being wiped, right? They've been disinfected with a, a wipe from somebody with gloves at the reception desk because all of these are potential sources of bringing the virus or whatever pathogen it is into our clinics. So really important to, um, to think about that. Um, you know, all these potential places where uh, the pathogen can come into our, our clinics. Now, the next part is the thing that was really written down on the slow, if you've been to the Slow Dentistry Global Network uh, website, was the proper disinfection of the surgery itself or the clinic itself. Now, we know that we use alcohol wipes, we use uh, different types of, of, of disinfectants to be, able to, you know, to be able to wipe down the chairs. But the problem is that we're wiping down the chairs but we're not letting the disinfectant work for the appropriate amount of time. So the, stif the, the uh, study showed that you need at least eight minutes, preferably 10 and longer for the, for the material to work. So in a clinic that has a high volume of patients coming in every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, every half an hour, that's not really something that people can do adequately. It's not gonna work. It's just like superficially wiping it down. You might as well just be wiping it down with detergent, right? And then getting the next person in because it's not really killing any of those uh, uh, pathogens or doing, doing any of the work. So what, what, what slow density is really gonna specify is that you have to have this time built in between 10 to 15 minutes between patients. Now you can see as many patients as you want. A slow dentistry clinic can see as many patients as they want throughout the day but you have to build between patients at least a 10 minute buffer or 15 minute buffer for the material to work. Now, Miguel uh, out in Lisbon, he only sees patients for an hour, right? So every patient is booked in for an hour, sometimes longer, but the minimum time that you can be booked in with him is for one hour. And even if you're coming in for suture removal, you will be given one hour, right? So that's just the way that his business operates. That's the way that he wants to work. Um, and as a result of this, he's got plenty of time to be able to, um, to sterilize and disinfect the, 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 the clinic. Now, practically on a, on, or, or, you know, for, for other dental clinics like myself, you know, we're not going to be seeing just one person in one hour, right? So if we're going to see a patient for 10 minutes for suture removal, then we will build in, the, and we have been for the last year or so, building in that 10 minutes extra to be able to wipe this chair down to make sure that we give it enough time for the disinfectant to work. So this is one of the main cornerstones of slow dentistry or was one of the main cornerstones of, of slow dentistry. Um, uh, but it's kind of being expanded on. And I think the one that uh, we have to think about uh, doing and, you know, I think our patients will appreciate this. Our, pers our patients will respect us for this. Our pat the patients, look, the world's going to change, right? As soon as, as soon as this time's over, the world's going to change. People, people are going to be more aware of health. People are going to be more, more aware of cleanliness. People are going to be more aware of, of those people who are really out to, to uh, look, look after the patients. They're not out for a fast buck. They're not out there to take advantage of them. So it's really important that the, the, the clinics of the future, the ones that are going to be successful out of this, are the ones that are going to be really uh, have the best of patients' um, uh, interests at heart. So when we build these things in, then automatically we will get, uh, you know, known that we are the clean, cleanest, uh, uh, the, the cleanest um, practice in the whole area. And from that, we will be making up any shortfall, potential shortfall that it could be because we're not seeing as many patients as maybe our, our neighbor down the road. Uh, the next point to mention is that uh, receptionists should avoid shaking hands. The dentist should avoid shaking hands uh, with people, our patients that are coming in. So, you know, you've seen the, the, um, uh, some of, the, ad, some of the, the video that's going online of uh, Trump uh, when this whole COVID thing was getting more and more uh, popular in the U.S. and he's doing the... the um, the interview or the press conference from the from the from the Rose Garden, and uh, he's shaking everybody's hand, right, and he's touching his face, etc. And he's saying that don't do these things, but he's doing them himself. And similarly, you know, we had um, a really funny video of Prince Charles going um, 
uh, I guess he was uh, coming to the, th the theater, right? And he, he was trying to shake people's hands and people were, what, didn't want to shake his hands and things. And now today we find out that he's got COVID, right? So he's, he's um, uh, been affected as well. So it's really important that our receptionists don't shake hands with the staff. And we don't shake hands, but we, we move to another type of greeting, you know, uh, whether that's the, you know, the namaste one or, or whatever it is that we choose or the elbow bump or whatever it is. I think this is going to become de rigueur. Uh, as time goes on. And in some cultures as well, and I, I'm not sure if it's like that in South Africa, it's definitely not here, but sometimes uh, there's a kiss on the cheek that you would give um, the staff members or you'd give the, uh, the patient a kiss on the cheek, more, more for a European thing, I think. Yeah. But it's going to be written into the slow density protocols that we're going to avoid this and definitely no kissing on the cheek between staff members as well. So, um, also the lips. you know, it's really important that we... Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right on the left. Well, anywhere, anywhere, ever, right? Okay. So trying to try, try and avoid it. And so then the next things we come to, uh, and I'm mindful of the time, so I'm going them, going through it a little bit quickly. Um, is that uh, we want to make sure that um, we use appropriate antimicrobials. Uh, before we start treating the patient, right? So, you know, when we do implants, we'll give them chlorhexidine to be able to use for like a minute beforehand before we place them. So I think for all, all procedures now, um, you know, we will be using antimicrobials. And uh, specifically for the virus, we've been finding that 1% uh, peroxide is very good for it. So the peroxyl comes from Colgate. It's made here in the UK by Colgate. The peroxyl has 1% hydrogen peroxide uh, mouthwash. So we'll get our patients to uh, rinse and gargle with this uh, before we actually um, treat them as well. Okay, so that's really important. And um, the next thing then coming to uh, then the treatment itself. Well, uh, from what you mentioned at the front that, you know, at the start of the, the, um, the, this meeting that you've been advised or some clinics are going and still treating patients, this is absolutely not the right thing to be doing. If you have any um, uh, consideration for the safety of humanity, the safety of South Africa, the safety of your place, the safety of your staff, yourself, your, your, your hygienists, your, uh, your family, uh, now is not the time to be working. And especially what, the thing that's caused the most confusion over here um, is with aerosol generating procedures, which is, or we're calling them AGPs now, uh, aerosol generating procedures. Because we went through... Um, uh, sort of like a, 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 a system of slowing down before we actually got to not seeing any patients. So before, okay, you can see everyone. The next thing was, well, you can see everybody except aerosol generating procedures. Then, okay, no, you have to cut things out and only see emergencies. Now we're not even seeing emergencies, right? So now it's only um, antimicrobials, analgesia, and advice. These are the three A's. And then if a patient needs treatment, we are directing them beyond this. We're directing them to, to particular um, hubs where um, dentists will have the full uh, PPE equipment, etc., the gloves, the masks, um, the, uh, the visors, etc., uh, because we know there's a shortage of them uh, all around the world at the moment. So um, definitely at this particular point, until we get more research, no aerosol generating procedures. And if for some reason you still have to, Better try to do it under rubber dam. Although there's some, some studies that are showing, unfortunately now just to put the, the fly in the ointment, that sometimes you'll get a little bit more of an aerosol generated with rubber dam, but at least it's not going to be coming from the patient's saliva. And that's why it's really important that uh, we have high volume aspiration. So the, the, the days of maybe the dentist working by himself or just using the saliva ejector, right? I think those days are gone. I think you really have to have somebody dedicated with the high volume aspirator uh, to be able to, uh, you know, at the point of where we're doing the, um, uh, the drilling, to be able to suck up as much of that aerosol as we can. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously the, the next part comes to the fact that, well, what protective equipment are we wearing whilst we're doing these procedures? So I definitely think goggles and visor is mandatory. Um, and the masks are mandatory together with um, a gown. Now, it's, there's a lot of debate about the masks and what type of masks we should have. Um, I, I think that the, the general feeling is that the masks that we have right now are not suitable. 
Um, I did see because some clinics didn't have the F, um, the, you know, the, the FPP2 ones or the three ones that they were using the, the masks that we have, but they were double masking. Okay. So yeah. double masking is something uh, that you can do if you don't have the, the proper, proper mask right now, but definitely the um, FFP2 and the FFP3. Uh, Everett, for you and I, we're going to have a problem with the FFP3 because you really need to be clean shaven, right? So um, to be able to, to be able to fit properly. So are you going to have to getting all the dentists to shave the beards or whatever? I was actually looking last night and Googling, well, if you do have a beard, can you get fitted for FFP3? And apparently the only thing that it's going to work for us is going to be those like Feynman's masks, those big gas masks that you're going to be putting on. Okay. So uh, I'm I'm, prepare, I'm preparing myself to actually get one of those and, and buy one of those when those when you know when it starts. So there is things for people with facial hair, um, uh, like myself, to be able to be able to use. But uh, if you're going to be using the FFP3, you have to be clean shaven to be in, enable it to be effective and to and to work. Um, and then uh, obviously we want to make sure that we're using rubber dam in general. It's one of the points of slow dentistry anyway. One of the cornerstones is that we're using rubber dam at least for every single RCT procedure, uh, if not more, so that's at, at a minimum. Uh, and obviously that will decrease the, the bacterial load and the bacteria that we're coming into and that we're aerosolizing into the atmosphere. And uh, coming towards the end of the points is that all rooms will really be aired regularly because we're finding that when we do the aerosol generating procedures, that the aerosols are staying in, in the atmosphere for at least two to three hours sometimes. So um, we're going to have to have a way where we air the rooms um, out so that uh, we, we remove as much of the, the, the pathogens as we can. And I think it's going to be a case where we may start to go down using ozone cleansers or, or HEPA filters or plasma filters in, in every uh, clinic to, cl to cleanse the air. Now, one, one uh, issue with the HEPA filters is this, that the conventional HEPA filters, so they're portable. My son's got allergies. So we have a HEPA filter in his bedroom. Um, the, you know, it's carbon filter, removes the dust, the, 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 the allergens from the air. It's really great. It really gives um, a, a really good, uh, clean um, air to be able to breathe in. Um, so there are ones that, that, are, that are there that you can buy. But the problem is that most of these HEPA filters only filter out 0.3 of a micron, up to a maximum 0.3 of a micron. Um, uh, and we know that the virus is about 0.17. So they're having to be updated uh, to be able to take the virus out of the atmosphere as well. So I would presume in the next month or two, there'll be a whole uh, host of companies coming out with uh, air purifiers. And specifically for, for us, I mean, they use routinely in ICU and uh, in, in, in hospitals anyway, like the plasma filtration. Um, and one of our slow uh, dentistry ambassadors, Bartos, uh, from Poland, he put on the chat today that he's actually just bought one of them uh, for the clinic. So I think uh, rather than jumping out and buying those things right now, you just rather hang hang on, hang tight, uh, wait for the, um, the the new ones that will definitely be able to take uh, the coronavirus out of the uh, atmosphere. I know the plasma filtration one takes out influenza, uh, but I'm not sure that it's going to be taking out coronavirus just yet. So. Um, other things, just by the by, when I'm thinking about them, that we, that, you know, that what did we do? Well, we have, sometimes we have magazines in the waiting room. So we've taken out the magazines from our waiting room. So we don't want anything that people can be touching and, and putting back and forth, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, trying to minimize the amount of patients that, that come into our surgery. So uh, before we were shut down, before all the clinics shut down, what we would do is we designated three zones or three areas in the clinic where patients could sit and only one patient could sit in that, in, that, in that place. So if we were going to be seeing, for example, we've got three clinics, three, three patients came in, they would be at the appropriate social distances from, from each other. Or alternatively, the better strategy was that we would tell the patient just to wait in the car, and then when the dentist was ready to see them, we would call them, and they would come straight into the clinic, no, no chit-chat at the, at the door or, or, or at the reception, but straight into the clinic and then uh, get to do the treatment. And the patients were very, very, very appreciat appreciative of this. So okay. don't think that, oh, it's going to put the patients out and it's going to, you know, uh, it's going to be more of a hassle. No, the patients really do appreciate it. So these are just some things uh, that sprung to mind. 
uh, when um, uh, we said, okay, we change it from the podcast that we were going to do, just chatting about DST, but go on to this. And I think it's a great idea. You know, this is a, a very worrying time for every one of us. It's a really worrying time to be a business owner right now because not seeing any patients means no money coming through. Yeah. And um, you know, we all hope that uh, we have businesses to go back. And I'm sure we will. This time is going to pass, right? But we might as well use it um, you know, for ourselves to become better people, to put in place protocols and systems that maybe we didn't have so that we become, you know, we, we safe, our, our, our staff are safe, our patients are safe, our families are safe. Um, and I think it's these practices that are really going to, going to, um, going to, the ones that are going to thrive. I, I, just before I came on here, I was in a, 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 a web meeting with Christian Coachman and some of the DSD clinics. And he said something really nicely that some people are just during this time that they're off, whether it's a two weeks or three weeks of shutdown, they're going to just chill, right? But we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that during this time, we, we're getting better as people, we're getting better as dentists, we're getting better as, uh, you know, we, we, we're meditating, we're thinking about the reasons that things that these things get in touch with, with, with the earth again, with the environment again. And uh, Brandon um, McDonald, who is... Um, one of the marketing chief marketing officer for for DSD he said something really nice that when the when the world was hitting pause you know we were hitting play right so this is really what we want to do we want to be proactive we want to make our clinics better for our patients when we come back again we're ready to go safety wise and and clinically wise so um, that's all really I, I have to share with you guys right now uh, I think if you have any questions I'll be more than more than happy to um, to, to talk to you about it or answer them. Yeah, guys, so just, um, Jareel, thanks so much. When you've got a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, while we're waiting for whoever wants to ask the first question, I, would, I just want to ask you, these things you mentioned now, these things you're going to implement for the rest of your, when you open your clinics again, you'll implement all these things. Yeah. For example, so, the magazine. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah correct. So, so, before being a slow dentistry clinic just meant well, from a sterilization and disinfection point of view was just making sure that you would wipe down the chair for the appropriate amount of time already assuming that you had really good cross infection protocols already in place. I mean, yeah. in the UK, we get examined on that every two years or every three years. There's, a, there's an external um, dentist that comes in, make sure that we've got the washer disinfector, make sure that we've got the autoclave working, make sure we're bagging specific instruments. So that's, that's a given, but then to implement all these other things. But what, the, what this event has really shown us, this tragic event in the world has really shown us, is that we really have to up our game and we have to try and uh, detail all these things little bit by bit, maybe 10 steps or 12 steps or 15 steps that we have to follow so that dentists all around the world can benefit from this. Right, then your advice for us for the next few weeks um, is close the clinic completely, just treat patients with analgesics and antimicrobials and refer them if we have to. Correct. So, but again, all this depends on, on uh, you guys as well, whether you have appropriate hubs to be able to treat the, uh, the patients that you're going to be sending them there. Right. So, um, uh, you know, last night, this is the first time that we were, we were let known about this is that we've got certain protocols that we will follow uh, like a telephone questionnaire that do you have pain? Is that pain being able to be controlled with analgesia? If not, okay, come back and see me in a week. If, if it's not being controlled with analgesia, then go to step two, then you'd ask them this particular question. Well, is it related? Is it keeping you awake? And all the things that we usually ask them, but just basically being able to triage them so that we can only refer on to the hubs those patients that really need it because we're going to expect that the health service is going to take a big hit here. And we want to try and keep out of accident emergency all those patients, all those patients that we could treat or that dentists in specific hubs could treat to take pressure off the, the health service and let them see um, patients that are, that are suffering with this, um, you know, in an ICU and in, in, you know, with respiratory problems. And as a practical rule, your, uh, your staff members, are they at home at this stage or are they at the clinic or what, what do you do with them? Yeah, so right now we have to have the clinic where well, we did have to have the clinic running up until yesterday before we were told to uh, go to uh, just triaging them. So right now, because we just have to triage them specifically, we could get a mobile phone and we can get the, the, the telephone number for the practice um, 
directed to the mobile phone and we could give advice over the phone, right? And if, you know, at specific points in the day, we will meet the patients uh, with some prescriptions or we could phone the prescriptions into the pharmacy. They could pick it up. That would be even better. So we don't have to do that. Uh, but for the last week or so, uh, we've just been down to a, a rota, okay? So what we would do is we'd have two specific uh, groups so that they are never meeting. So if one group goes down, then we have that other group to follow up on it. But we would maybe you know, do two days, one group, uh, three days, another group, and vice versa, that kind of thing. So basically dividing them into teams. Right. So right now, we, you know, we don't have a full complement of nurses working, but we have one or two. Right. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? Darby, I know you always have questions to ask. I think you're exactly right, uh, uh, Jamil. Um, basically, uh, I, I agree. We've got to go there. We have a problem with um, having a hub that you refer to. Um, a serious problem with that. Um, but in effect, what we've done is we've practically shut down. We've got two emergency teams that rotate. Um, and uh, we triage by phone and only if it cannot be done, as you said, uh, with your three A's, uh, uh, do we go in and, and, and manage. All right. I think other than that, we're risking ourselves, we're risking our clients, we're risking our staff. Not worth it. It's not worth it, man. Uh, absolutely. Life will go on after this and we want to be part of that <laughs> rather than being sick or, or be the cause of somebody else becoming sick. Guys, just on a practical note, who, who keeps that phone? Are you guys keeping it by yourselves or one of the receptionists or what do you do? So right now we haven't moved on to that just yet because we still have staff in the surgery or in the clinic, as I told you, those teams that are going through. So, so last night they prepared, the, the, the chief dental officer prepared a script. I told you already to triage the patients, but they also prepared a script for out of hour services, they want the same telephone message to be heard by every patient. When they phone that we'll get back to you tomorrow, if it's really urgent and you exhibiting signs of COVID, then you will be directed to a specific area. So there's a difference, I forgot to say to that, there's a difference between hubs that will be for specific COVID patients and people who are no symptoms. So I'm talking about referring patients to the, the asymptomatic group, to the dentist who will man it, will have the, 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 the masks, will have everything on. But the people who, who are exhibiting um, uh, symptoms, they are only going to be going to the dental hospital here on floor six, where they will be dealt with, with the full kit, everything. Hazmat suits, everything. Cool. Darby, practically, you guys, are you keeping the phone with you, or who's got that phone for patients to phone in? No, we, we, we've got staff doing a, a, an initial triage, right, just to filter out that we don't become receptionists uh, uh, trying to tell people that the practice is closed. Um, but, uh, 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 and then from there, if need be, they will refer the patient out to uh, one of the dentists, depending on who's on duty, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when it becomes a, a, a clinical call, uh, uh, rather than uh, just we want to make an appointment, because we're still getting a lot of those. Um, uh, people seem to forget that there's actually a shutdown or a lockdown, uh, mm -hmm. strangely enough. Okay, guys, if I can come in here, it's just speaking. What we've done is we've shut our practice down completely. Um, we have a, a telephone wow. system which w leaves a message for patients to SMS or WhatsApp our receptionist who has the emergency phone at home. She will filter out uh, uh, the appropriate calls and then um, obviously WhatsApp or SMS us as, as dentists. Um, we two dentists, so what we've decided is that we're not going to expose our staff to any risk whatsoever. So we're going to be assisting one another. So if there is an emergency call that has to be done, um, one of us will be the clinician and one will be the assistant. I don't know how that sounds, but we've decided for our practice because our, our, our staff don't want to come in. That's it. Um, they've made that very clear. That's and fair enough, Dees. I, I think it's a good call uh, in, in general. I think what we just have to look at is uh, uh, what exactly are the protocols that are, that, that, that are being implemented in your practice and in your clinic and yeah. all that type of stuff. Uh, I know that yours is pretty up to date and on the go. What yeah. we've done is that we've actually put a barrier at the door. All right? If you come in the door, the first thing you do is you will wash is your hands. sanitize your hands. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not that 
I don't think sanitizer does it, to be quite honest with you. I've seen too, no. many, too many people sanitize. Jamil, maybe you guys can anybody else give us feedback. But I see sanitizer being used as a quick fix. And, uh, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, they don't do it properly. I absolutely. Don't, yeah, but I, don't like, sure. I don't like the idea of sanitizer. So basically, they have okay. to wash their hands. They have to put a mask on and they have to put everything yeah. that's not in a bag in a bag that we supply, right? Yeah. And then similar to, to Jim, as you said, we try and separate them as far as possible or have as few people coming in. Um, yeah. And from there, they go straight into the uh, clinic. And in the clinic, we've set up a whole range of protocols for the staff to, to follow as well, yeah. to make sure that they have the minimum possible uh, um, uh, exposure. Um, yeah. It's, uh, um, yeah, we, we, we've got to be as strict as possible that people don't want to play the game, they stay at home. Yeah, well, what we've done is there's a form that SADA put out that says, I so-and-so consent to treatment. I realize I am at risk and I'm putting the dentist at risk. And then they, you, have, you have to ask them five questions. Um, um, of, well, what we're doing too is we're using a, a non-touch uh, thermal um, um, Thermometer. Uh, yeah, yeah. screening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what we do. So the folk come in. In our case, we've got a disinfection center right there at the door. They have to sanitize their hands. That's what we're doing. And then before we do anything, they fill in this form. Um, and we see that they, whether they've traveled overseas, etc. cetera, the five questions, shortness of breath, etc. cetera. And we also thermally screen them with a, a non-touch device. Uh, there's, there's, one thing, there's, there's one thing that I forgot to mention that... Um, this is what the guys out in Singapore, Hong Kong are doing routinely now, is the yeah. non-contact thermometer. So patient yeah. comes in, uh, non-contact thermometer. And then, and then not just for them, but the staff are getting it done this twice a day as well. So they're yeah. doing it in the morning and the afternoon. And if anybody's exhibiting a higher temperature, they're being sent home. Absolutely. That's exactly what we've been doing since this right. whole thing perfect, broke. Perfect. But we're going to keep it going now as a, as a normal routine. A lot of the things that we've instituted now that we may not have had before, like the disinfection station, et cetera, at the front door. So what they do is when they come in, they disinfect, they fill in the form, they get screened, they sign the form, and we're happy to see them. We see them with the appropriate um, hygiene measures. And once they leave, the last thing they do is they disinfect their hands, sanitize their hands, and leave the practice. Um, so we've yeah, done that. I, I think Deech, you've got a you've got a good point there. I, I think this has been a wake up call for us in general in, in, in the levels that we have to function with uh, or function at in, in, in our clinics. Um, and I agree with you. It's it's something that's got to stay. Uh, yeah. um, I see major sure. major benefits. Um, yeah. Yeah, from, from our perspective as clinicians, I'm very happy about this all. I just don't like the whole concept. I think it's something very sinister yes. behind the whole pandemic, but that's it. <laughs> I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think <laughs> we have to look at those type of things as well, and I'm sure more things will come out um, afterwards, and I hope it's not going to be some sort of like blame game, and then we're into some sort of uh, you know, escalation all around the world, military and things like this, but you never know. Trump never. doesn't play game, blame games, hmm? ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I must say, Jamil, what I've done is, you know, I tend to be a workaholic. And this is the first time in my entire practicing career that I will have ever smelled 21 days of not being at work, yeah, except absolutely. for emergencies. And I've just decided, I've resigned myself to that fact. I have my kids at home. I have a lovely wife. I live in a comfortable home. I'm just going to enjoy it. Yeah, well, and, that's absolutely true. So I, I, I'm speaking to uh, Huang Huang in Beijing, and they, they're just coming out of their lockdown eight weeks later. And um, yesterday he was saying this is the first day that we've seen uh, the traffic on the road again, the traffic jams in Beijing. So things are returning back to normal. Uh, and what he said was that when I was looking back at the time, I wish I hadn't wasted it. Um, the best thing that I did yeah. was to get uh, one ton of masks and supply them to the local hospital. Um, and then he said that uh, this time is going to go. You, you, you know, you're going to be back to normal again soon. Uh, so use it well. So this is coming from people yeah. who are right there in the epicenter, you know, of the, of yeah. the main thing. 
And I think we, we have to learn from each other. And definitely, it's not just a case of, I mean, you know, the, I spoke to another person. I don't know if you guys know Mario Mbergia. He's an amazing dentist based in Italy. So uh, I, I, I sent a, a message to him last, last week or the week before. Hi, Mario. How are things going? Uh, thinking about you. Um, he's in Palermo. And he was saying, uh, don't worry, Jamil, we will come out of this stronger. But one thing, that's got, one thing that I've come out of this is that I've been enjoying my family like never before. So you bet. there's definitely going to be good things that come out of it. So just let's try and use it wisely. Absolutely. Just a thought about chairs. Um, it's not a bad thing to have two chairs. And what I used to do when I was on my own, I had three chairs. I used to alternate them. Yes. And um, I used to give presentations in infection control. And I used to call it dressing up and dressing down a chair. Um, so you'd use a chair, it would be cleaned. Then you'd move to the next surgery. It did mean that you'd have to obviously um, spend the extra money to equip three surgeries, both in terms of materials and equipment. But if you want to really practice good infection control, that's not a bad way of doing it because you only get back to that first chair because I work on an hour per appointment as well. I always have. So it means here, yeah, then it's two hours before you get back to that back other to chair. chair. And Makes that sense. gives it a Makes really, sense. Yeah. But it's, it's an expensive way of doing it. Yeah. You know, but um, anyway. Marku, I'd uh, share that with you. I was going to ask Marku quickly. Marku is not part of the study group, but he's a friend of ours from Joburg. And I just want to ask him, what's the general feeling of the guys in Joburg? How are you guys operating and what, what are they going to do for the three weeks? Because I kind of feel like everyone wants to go on as normal. So what do you think is happening up there? Can you hear Marku? Let me just quickly... Uh... There we go. Yeah, sorry, I've got you there. Um, yeah, I think the general feeling is, is pretty much the same. We, we're all closing practice and uh, only emergencies, prescription, triage, and, and, and those sort of things. Yeah, so that, that is the general consensus. But there is, a, there is some people that, that are forging forward and, and want to work, trying to, uh, you know, uh, risk it all. So we'll see. I don't know. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, I think the general consensus basically is shut down and, and wait. Well, I said we're going yeah, well to try and keep it under an hour. Is there anything else, anyone else who wants to add something or wants to ask a question? Jumbo? Yeah, yeah I I want to ask I, one question. Ivet, how, how many times did you touch your face tonight? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all the time. I know. All the time. It's so difficult, isn't it? It's so difficult. It's unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very difficult <laughs> because that's another point, Jamil. Is I've actually advised folk to actually wash, not guys, us. I used to do that, but I got out of the habit. At the end of the day, before I went home, obviously I washed my hands thoroughly, and I used to wash my face because the first yeah. thing that happened is when I got home, my wife would want to have a kiss. <laughs> and uh, but as we've got older now, I thought, ah. Well. <laughs> You know, so what? She's probably immune to most things anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just want to say, um, Eva, thanks for organizing things. And Jamil, thanks for your time. No, it's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. And, and Evid, hopefully, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Evid, hopefully we'll get a chance. Maybe when this is over, we can go back to our original podcast and we can just have a chat about um, other things in life and, and things to do with, with dentistry again. Uh, so, uh, so dentistry. Just, just to wrap it up, the, the consensus is, we're all closing our shops. We're only treating patients via the phone. And I want you all to maybe send this message to everyone out there and, and get the message out so everyone's on board and everyone listens to this. And um, we actually do it, not just say we do it. And, but what, what, and one, what, one, what, one, one last thing, Evett, one last thing. That if, if you guys can go in and have a look at the Slow Dentistry Global Network uh, website, uh -huh. have a look at it. Um, uh, you know, text uh, or email Nina. Again, she's born in South Africa. That's Miguel's sister. She runs it. Uh, and get more information. It really is going to be the, the, the thing that sets your clinics apart, I think. So uh, enjoy. Yeah. Great cool. fun, this guys, so and peace. Guys. Take it easy. Take it easy, guys. And Love thanks again, you. Everett. I really appreciate it. Cheers, okay, bye. all the best. Stay safe, guys. Stay safe. <laughs> thanks, Everett. Okay, right. All the best.